What themes do you like to invest and what's your sweet spot? Um, there are two categories in which we're investing right now. Uh, for me, on the consumer internet side, um, I have an additional sort of two subcategories. So within consumer internet, the two themes that I've been really interested in are one, what I call a sharing economy. Uh, others have called it collaborative consumption. But the notion that consumers now are actually sharing the things, not just information about themselves, but actually their goods and their belongings and their time. Yes. And so examples of that would be Zimride, where people are sharing rides with one another, mm -hmm. TaskRabbit, where uh, people are sharing their time and allowing people who are really busy to leverage other people who might have some free time to get some of their errands done. Yeah. The second component of uh, consumer internet that I've been really interested in is what I call social commerce. And I've made two investments in that space. One is a company called ModCloth, which uh, empowers independent designers basically to uh, sell through their curated website out to women who are really interested in sort of independent fashion. Mm. And then the second component to that has also been a new sort of stealth company uh, in the jewelry space. And that also it has a strong social component and I'm really excited that they'll be launching in April. Great. And there's been some incredible write-ups about yourself. Um, so you obviously, it's wonderful to read about women mm -hmm. that are doing well yeah. and are successful, but um, it's just wonderful to hear these really fantastic Raves about you oh, media. thank you. So I, I, I'm just so um, pleased to be interviewing you. What, one other thing I would mention yes. is that, so uh, those are the investments that I've been doing on the consumer side. Yes. Um, I do investments also on the business software services side. So because my background is more technical in nature, uh, my PhD involved a lot of work in uh, computer security, and so right. security's actually been an area of focus for me as well. Cool. And then uh, mathematics is also a core area of interest for me, mm -hmm. and that has been applied in the big data area, particularly with respect to analytics. So right. that's also another category of investment. And so I guess that extends into the cloud. And yes, the, yeah. yes, absolutely. Right. Right. What do you look for in women entrepreneurs and startups that indicate interest to you in investing in their businesses? You know, it's interesting for me, uh, the difference between female entrepreneurs and male entrepreneurs and what I look for is not different at all. Good. And so uh, what I look for is truly authentic entrepreneurs. And what I mean by that is that that entrepreneur can't imagine, I can't imagine them doing anything else besides right. this one startup. Right. And they probably can't imagine it either. And what I also look for is a fundamental market or technological insight that they have. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that depends on being very authentic. So two great examples of female entrepreneurs who had that kind of authentic market insight. Mm -hmm. One was uh, Susan Koger, who uh, works at WordNick and was a co-founder of WordNick. I, I apologize, mod cloth. Okay. And um, she had been uh, vintage clothing shopping since she was 13 years old uh, with her grandmother in Florida and continued to do so throughout college and happened to put up a website where she could resell some of the vintage clothing that she had bought. And on the first day, she had a sale. And from then on, she was addicted to this notion of how can I really scale this business? How can I make shopping truly fun and feel like discovery for every individual out there. Mm. And she's driven by that vision. And it comes from a very authentic place within herself. She is an avid shopper. Right. She, is, uh, she has an incredible sense of style. But she's also unique in the sense that she says, and even in high school, people would come to her from all sorts of groups um, and ask her for fashion advice. And people weren't afraid to do that. And she always wanted to scale that out. And I love that vision where she believes that shopping doesn't have to be scary and fashion doesn't have to be scary. It could be a lot of fun. Yes. And, um, and you see that when you go into the Mod Claw site. Right. The other example is uh, Aaron McKean of WordNick, who was a lexicographer uh, at Oxford English Dictionary. And she knew she wanted to be a lexicographer when she was nine years old. Wow. And um, as a result of her knowledge and working within, uh, as an editor for Dictionary for so long, yes. she understood 
she had a very clear viewpoint on what a dictionary really should be mm. in this day and age yes. and what was holding it back from being from fulfilling its full potential and so I love entrepreneurs like Aaron and Susan who have that truly authentic vision of what something can be mm -hmm. and I can participate in that mm -hmm. in that vision and that dream mm -hmm. it, it's almost as if they're just following their destined path isn't yeah. it? by the sounds of yeah, it it's a it really wonderful is. Um, um, way of um, working out who you're going to work with right Fantastic. Advice for pitching for venture is often correlated with dating. My background's in the online dating mm -hmm. industry. What sort of chemistry makes for a good match and is a success for both entrepreneur and venture capitalist? I think fundamentally it comes down to trust. Right. Um, I found that there are certain people, when, when they say you click with someone else, it has to do with uh, a mutual alignment of the vision of where you want to take things, yes. but also a mutual trust in one another. Yes. And uh, I really do believe that one of the most important things between an investor and an entrepreneur is that you're both aligned. And that's why I really love this truly early stage of investing, where uh, the entrepreneur and the investor are really aligned in terms of when we raise our follow-on financing and if they get completely diluted, we're probably facing the same thing as well. Right. Um, and the the dream and sort of the, the part of the entrepreneur not being jaded at that moment is, is a wonderful thing for me as well. Um, and so at this stage of investing, it really isn't about the financial model. It's not about uh, the the track record of right. what's already happened. Mm -hmm. It really is about gut instinct, and that's where this analogy uh -huh. of dating really comes in. You can't yes. ever really tell someone exactly why you fell in love, yes. but you just know that you did, yes. and that's yes. exactly the way it is with an entrepreneur. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Great to have a woman's perspective on that. Um, in your experience, are there many women entrepreneurs that are unsuccessful in sourcing venture? We already know that the percentages of women who are successful are very low. Yeah, and I think, again, in that, for, for women and for men, I would say it's exactly the same, right? So uh, what people forget often is that truly uh, entrepreneurship and startups is a game of excellence. And there is a high failure, failure rate for male entrepreneurs as well as for female entrepreneurs. I think there aren't as many female entrepreneurs playing the game, and mm -hmm. so you don't see them as often. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, when people ask me, you know, are there really awesome female entrepreneurs out there? I have to say, yes, we have a ton of them in our portfolio. Yes. And um, I'm super proud of them because we've held them to the same rigor and standard that we've held every other entrepreneur. We're not making investments because they're women. Right. We're making investments in them because we really think that they're awesome. Right. Do you think then that um, women feel that they have to perform even better than men? There's some people have given me that feedback in these interviews. Um, it might be the case that that's a pressure that they put on themselves. Yes, yeah. And I think that's true of all women, right? And I think uh, if I look at myself versus my husband as a really good example, um, in college, uh, he told me that he never left an exam having thought that he did anything but ace it, yes. right? And I actually remember every single exam being one where I left thinking, oh, problem number four, maybe I didn't you do it agonized. quite yeah. perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, there was another approach to that proof that I could have mm -hmm. taken, mm -hmm. which was much more elegant. Um, and I would agonize over every single detail. Mm -hmm. And it's not that my husband actually aced every single test, but he believed it. And I think that's prevalent with a lot of women, yes, even I've after you get out of school, right? Mm -hmm. You've you finished all your exams and actually you have a lot of data points that prove out that your fundamental instincts aren't right about how you've performed. Mm -hmm. And yet still you have that nagging doubt. And uh, 
I think that that is part of the problem, right? Is that a lot of female entrepreneurs, a lot of female professionals will always feel that nagging doubt and you have to push through that. Whereas um, a lot of male entrepreneurs and male professionals will just believe. And I think that's the part that becomes very difficult in entrepreneurship yes. is that there are so many people around you that are telling you, no, yes. this isn't possible. Yes. These are the reasons why it's going to be so hard. Yes. And if you give yourself even the slightest bit of opening to even listen or hear those comments, yes. then there's a higher probability that you're going to give up. Yes. And so you have to see those barriers or those walls as minor speed bumps. Mm -hmm. And that optimism is really, really important to develop. And I think mm -hmm. with women, you really actually have to develop it internally. So maybe women listen to everyone more than the men. Yeah. Um, because you're right, you do have to have that um, ability to, against all odds, keep right. going and just um, in a butt-headed sort of way, just ignore what, what everyone else is saying. Yeah, be very, very stubborn. So maybe that's what, what part of the problem is. Um, what do you think that women entrepreneurs and startups could do to increase their chances in sourcing venture then? In I think that uh, I think that they just need to play the game, mm -hmm. right? And I just it, that's that's the thing that I I truly believe is that every every woman who believes that they could be an entrepreneur, they can be. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that. Uh, Especially when you're young, you need to play that game. You, right. If you even believe for the slightest bit that you want to be an entrepreneur, yes. you need to do it. And yes. you need to do it in that moment. You can't hold yes. off for a better time. You can't hold off for a moment when things are more stable or yes. you have a little bit more experience. Yes. You have to do it then. Yes. And uh, too often I find a lot of the students that I work with are waiting until they have a little bit more experience, until they have... Uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, time under their belt, having worked at another company or seen a few more successes. And I just, I do believe that there's no better time than now for everyone. And especially today where the entrepreneurs actually have a lot of the power, it's, it's a great time for all, all women entrepreneurs to get involved. Yes. And it's just a matter of where do you find your inspiration? What empowers you what are you passionate about and going for it so it sounds like um, women really need to boost their confidence mm -hmm. and, and just give it a shot and not not sort of thinking about all the possibilities of what could happen right yeah thank you